Hello and welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by the Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists, the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, and WJE. My name is Liz Pimper and I'll be your moderator for this webinar on the successful implementation of vibration control during museum construction projects. Our presenters today are Arnie Johnson, Principal and Structural Engineer with WJE, Frank Zakari, retired Head of Conservation at the Art Institute of Chicago, and Mark Ryan, Assistant Director for Collections and Exhibitions at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. During the next hour, we will hear about the effects of vibrations on humans, buildings, and artwork, as well as a scientific methodology for vib vibration control that has been successfully implemented during several recent museum construction projects. WJE is a registered course provider with the American Institute of Architects. You are eligible to receive one AIA CES credit for your participation in today's webinar. Following the presentation, we will send you an email with instructions on how to obtain your credit, as well as a link to a recording of the webinar so that you can share today's information with others in your organization. Now, I'll turn it over to Arnie Johnson to get started. Thank you, Liz, and good afternoon, and thank you very much for the chance to speak to you all today. Uh, you may be interested to know that there are about 300 of you attending this webinar, so it's clear that this topic is very important and timely. We have about 220 different institutions represented from about 40 different states across the U.S., and there are about 25 of you from outside the U.S., so it's truly an honor to speak with you all, and we hope the information we share will be a benefit to each of you. I am Arnie Johnson. I'm a structural engineer and vibration expert with WJE in Chicago. My co-presenters, as Liz has already introduced, are Frank Zakari, uh, retired head of conservation from the Art Institute of Chicago, and Mark Ryan, assistant director for collections and exhibitions at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis. I'll be kicking things off here, and then Frank and Merv will share uh, later in the webinar. Here's an outline of where we're headed. Uh, after some quick background, we'll spend some time helping us all get a feel <laughs> for different levels of vibration. We know this is a somewhat theoretical topic, and so we want to try to make it as practical as we can. Uh, next, we'll walk through the process for vibration control using an example project. And finally, Mark and Frank will share their perspectives on this topic. We hope to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer the questions that you submit uh, via the chat. So with that, let's dig in. I first met Frank uh, when the Modern Wing addition to the Art Institute of Chicago was in early conceptual design in the early 2000s, so nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, WJE was structural engineering consultant on that project, and in the design process, it soon became clear to us that the heavy demolition of previous buildings on the site and the deep foundation construction for the new wing we're going to generate significant vibrations very near some of the Art Institute's most prominent active galleries. At that time, the effects of construction vibrations on art had not been researched much. And so together with Frank, we developed a method to understand and manage the vibrations throughout that project. Since then, we've used that same method or a variation of it at a number of other museums most of which are listed here. And I know that several individuals from these different museums are attending this webinar. So hello to you and thank you for uh, your partnership on these projects. I also know that other consultants have led similar initiatives at other museums that are not listed here. Uh, so welcome to you as well. In all of this work, we've learned that the goals for vibration control in the context of a museum are very unique and very different than for a normal construction project. The first and foremost objective is protection of the collection from harm during the construction. This is simply non-negotiable. But also, we found that it's very helpful for the museum to receive guidance before construction starts to facilitate their advanced planning, such as what vibration levels to expect and where, and where might art need to be deinstalled before construction. The final goal is reliable enforcement of clear conservative vibration limits but without unduly encumbering the designers, which could limit their design approach, or the contractors, which could increase construction cost and schedule. Before I explain the method to accomplish and support those goals, I'd like to give you a short primer, if you will, on vibrations and how they can affect people, buildings, and artwork. 
At the most basic level, vibrations originate at a source, transmit through a media, normally soil, and then reach a receiver, in our case, a building of some kind. Now, the vibrations transmit through the soil in different ways, depending on what causes the vibration. Transient vibrations result from sudden ground impacts that generate a large initial response and then quickly dampen out with time. On the other hand, steady state vibrations are imparted into the ground by continuous, steady, high energy activities such as vibratory roller compaction or vibratory pile driving. The magnitude or intensity of the vibration is measured in what is called peak particle velocity. And I'll be using inches, units of inches per second throughout this presentation. And the change of vibration intensity with time is called the vibration frequency, which is measured in hertz or numbers of cycles per second. So in all the charts that I'm going to be showing uh, in this presentation, and I do have a few charts, I am an engineer after all, uh, on the vertical axis will always be peak particle velocity in inches per second, which you can think of as the strength or intensity or amplitude of the vibration. And on the horizontal axis will always be frequency in hertz, which is the cyclic rate or speed of the vibrations. And notice that both axes are log scale. So first, let's talk about human perception. Your human body can perceive extremely low levels of vibration. Roughly speaking, depending on the frequency of the vibration, human perception begins way down around 0 0.03 inches per second. And vibrations become disturbing to the human body when they reach intensities around 0.2 inches per second. Next, ambient or background levels in buildings due to normal day-to-day -day activities can range from 0.02 to 0.06 and often up to 0.1 inches per second. You can see some common values there for things like closing doors, crowds walking, running, jumping. Just note the last two bullets in the list. We measured vibrations inside the Art Institute due to passing train traffic up to 0 0.07 and moving tables and chairs after an event actually generated vibrations up to 0.15 inches per second. So vibrations due to normal building activities can be quite significant, well above the human perception threshold, which remember again is down around 0 0.03 inches per second. Now let's consider the effect of vibrations on buildings. And in particular, what levels of vibration can cause damage to buildings? The US Bureau of Mines carried out extensive studies in the 1970s and 80s to evaluate the effect of blasting vibrations on nearby residential structures. And this early work is still cited as a standard to this day. By the way, that is Jack Wiss at the lower left, one of WJE's founders and a pioneer in the field of construction vibrations. Mr. Wiss was heavily involved in the Bureau of Mines testing. Based on their work, the Bureau of Mines reported damage levels for buildings. Threshold damage, which they defined as hairline cracking of plaster finishes and similar very minor cosmetic damage, typically appeared at about three inches per second and was never observed at less than 0.5 inches per second. Minor damage, such as hairline cracking in brick, typically appeared at about four and a half inches per second. And major structural damage, like foundation cracking, did not occur until much higher levels. The Bureau of Mines then published a recommended safe limit to prevent threshold damage in buildings. And this remains the most common limit used in the US to protect buildings from, from vibrations. You can see that the limit has a base value of 0.5 inches per second and then increases at higher frequencies because higher frequency vibrations are typically less damaging to buildings. I just want to point out that international standards have similar limits as described in our paper from 2015. And by the way, I'll provide citations for all of these papers at the end of the webinar. Here you can see the limits from the British, Swiss, and German standards, and indeed they are similar to the USBM limit. So fortunately, there is relatively good agreement on vibration limits to protect buildings. But now for the complicated subject of art and vibrations. I say complicated because, as you can imagine, by looking at all these different art objects that we've encountered during our work, each object is going to respond differently to vibration, right? Because each has a different size and shape and mass. 
To further complicate matters, each object is also in a different condition, right? Some are very sound and others are very fragile and weak. So we need to admit at the outset that the response and vulnerability of art to vibrations is extremely variable and complicated. Much more information on the subject of art and vibrations is available in our papers, but just briefly here, it's fairly easy to conceive of a reasonable limit by superimposing the different pieces of information that we've just learned in this webinar. Remember, limits to protect buildings from damage are relatively clear. A base limit of 0.5 inches per second is common in the United States, and international standards are similar. Remember we said that the onset of human perception to vibration begins way down around 0.03 inches per second. And then we said that common ambient levels in most museum buildings are typically up to 0.06 and often up to 0.1 inches per second. So recognizing the uncertainties and erring on the side of conservatism, most museums that we've worked with have used a vibration limit such as that shown here. It's at the top end of the ambient levels that buildings already experience, but well below building damage levels. It has a base value of 0.1 inches per second, and in some cases can increase at higher frequencies depending on the nature of the structure and the proximity of the vibrations. This limit should be conservative to protect most objects that are in reasonably sound condition, and it has been used without damage for several museum construction projects. There are some important possible exceptions and caveats regarding this limit. First, walking of light objects can occur on smooth surfaces at lower levels. Resonance of objects that happen to have a natural frequency similar to the frequency of the construction vibrations can be problematic. And of course, extremely fragile objects or those with serious pre-existing weaknesses might be susceptible at lower levels. And I'll be illustrating some of these special effects at the end of my talk. Well, we've covered a lot of ground already. That takes us through parts one and two of the webinar. Next, part three, I want to explain the process for vibration control at a museum. And to do that, I'd like to use the analogy of a three-legged stool. <laughs> you all know that a three-legged stool relies on having all three legs in order to stand up. Well, in the same way, successful vibration control at a museum relies on three phases in order to accomplish or hold up the goals that I laid out earlier. And the three phases are organized according to the timeline of the construction. Before construction, there is typically pre-construction testing on the site, planning with the museum and development of a vibration control specification for the project. Then at the start of construction, there should be means and methods submittals by the contractor, and then vibration trials, which I will explain. And then during construction, this is what most people think about, is the vibration monitoring that should occur continuously with appropriate alarms and protocols to protect the collection. Well, to explain how the process works, I'd like to take an example, which will be our current work with Mark Ryan at the Kemper Art Museum. Washington University is embarking on a major capital construction project that involves an addition to the museum and construction of five new buildings nearby, as well as a central underground parking structure. The completed museum will feature a stainless steel facade to reflect the surrounding landscape and beautiful new galleries with tall ceilings and natural lighting. When construction is complete in 2019, this is what the east end of the university campus will look like. You can see how the museum is nestled right in there among all of this new construction. This slide will show the progression of the construction at the Kemper over the past year. Last summer, site demolition and deep excavation began right next to the base of the building, which transmitted significant vibrations into the museum. Earth retention and foundation construction followed, also generating significant vibration. And then by December and certainly January, we had snow on the ground here in the Midwest, uh, but construction continued and the adjacent buildings began to rise above grade in 2018. Now during this time period, vibrations are typically much less than during the early grade level work. But currently, uh, the contractor has just begun some of the most critical vibration causing work on the project. Demolition of the museum's north facade and old lobby are underway, as close as about 30 feet 
from artwork inside. And next month, they will demolish the whole concrete terrace, which is where the new museum addition will be situated. So how did we help the university and Mark and his staff manage the vibrations during this very large project? Well, we walked through each phase of the vibration control method one at a time, each leg of the three-legged stool. So first, before construction, we performed vibration testing in the museum. There on the lower left, you can see our engineers instrumenting the building. We installed about 30 accelerometers through the museum galleries and art storage rooms nearest the construction. And then with the museum instrumented like a laboratory, we made low level impacts around the perimeter of the building using a large modal hammer and a calibrated heel drop plate. We also had the contractor perform simulated activities using actual construction equipment operating outside the building. By scaling up all of the low level data that we collected, and by comparing it to the data from the actual construction equipment, we then predicted the vibrations that the museum should expect during actual construction. We typically present the test results in the form of vibration contour lines, and I'll explain. These are the vibration contours on the screen for 0.1 inches per second, which is the artwork protection limit selected by the Kemper for their project and for various sizes of site grading and excavation equipment. The work is assumed to occur here along the closest proximity line, shown by that heavy yellow band. And the first brown contour line is where we estimate 0.1 inches per second will occur inside the building if light excavation equipment is used, like a small bulldozer. The next brown line is where we estimate 0.1 will occur if larger excavation equipment is used, like the large excavators shown in the pictures there. The next line is where 0.1 will occur if a large vibratory roller compactor is used. So you get the idea. Here's just one more example. These are the contours for selective demolition equipment, which could range from light chipping hammers all the way up to large hydraulic breakers like the ones shown there. So these contour lines are just a simple way to see graphically how far into the building a potentially problematic level of vibration might transmit. So one can, can go through that same exercise for all vibration causing activities that the contractor is planning to use and then overlay the results. It's messy as you can see, but with study, it's a very useful tool for planning purposes. So considering all the contour lines and depending on how heavy the construction will be allowed to be in different zones of the building, one can begin to draw a single line closest to the construction where it should be safe for artwork to remain. And we have come to call this line the safe line. Behind the safe line is the protected zone, which should be safe for artwork to remain. But in front of the safe line is the unprotected zone, where art objects that are sensitive to vibrations should be deinstalled. And indeed, as Mark will explain in a few minutes, were deinstalled before construction began. Then during construction, Vibration monitors are positioned along the safe line as a line of defense in order to protect the artwork behind. All of these requirements should be spelled out very carefully in a specification section that is put into the contract's, contractor's contract for the project, right? So it's legally binding on the contractor. Well, all of that happens before construction and is the first leg in the three-legged stool. The second leg of the process occurs at the start of construction and begins with the contractor's means and methods submittals, followed by field trials of actual equipment. These are some examples of the many field trials at the Kemper. You know, the predictions based on the site testing are good, but they're just that, estimates and predictions for planning purposes. Given the value of the objects that are being protected, it's prudent to perform field verification trials for every vibration causing activity, but operating at a safe distance from the art. If vibrations measured during the trials are within limit, construction using that equipment can proceed. But if not, the contractor is required to change the equipment and methods and repeat the trial. Once the trials have been completed, construction can proceed and the final phase in the vibration monitoring protocol should be the monitoring that is performed continuously during construction. Monitoring serves as the final proof for the museum 
that potentially damaging vibrations are not caused by the contractor at any time during the construction. We had up to eight vibration monitors along the safe line inside the Kemper during the project. Each monitor is connected remotely to a central data acquisition system that receives and analyzes the data in real time. Now for a museum project, it's critical that the monitoring system be capable of triggering alarms and sending immediate notifications of any above limit vibrations. The notifications should go to the museum, the vibration consultant, but most importantly, to the contractor's foreman on site, right, who must order that construction nearby stop immediately. The cause of alarm must be reviewed, the building inspected if necessary, and the contractor's methods changed if appropriate, before construction can resume. We issue reports of the data weekly throughout the construction. These reports are very useful to the museum to confirm that vibrations have been within limit and also to the contractor so he can see what vibrations his work has actually caused and where. Here you can see, for example, that vibration levels were elevated at this particular monitor at these times. Here are some views of my vibration monitors in galleries. Uh, we're currently using a brand new generation of vibration monitor by SIGICOM out of Switzerland. This is a web-based, cloud-based system that has tremendous functionality and allows viewing of the data from each monitor remotely in real time. You can see that the monitors fit within small enclosures that can blend quite nicely with the surrounding galleries. Well, that's the process. Uh, just before I turn it over to Frank and Mark, I'd like to mention a few special topics, including the potential for resonance and walking, something on short-term versus long-term vibrations, i.e. fatigue effects, and a bit on vibrations that art experiences during transportation. This short video using our vibration shake table demonstrates the potential for resonance of objects. On the left is a photograph of an ancient Chinese jade collection at the Art Institute. You can see that uh, all of these objects are different sizes and are mounted on small wire pins. It's essentially a series of small tuning forks. On the right is the model we built to simulate that. We have different sizes of metal discs that are attached to a wooden block mm -hmm. with metal rods. And what we'll do now is apply a constant steady state vibration while we sweep the input through a range of frequencies. And what you'll see is that when the input frequency matches the natural frequency of each metal disc, the disc will resonate. So at five hertz, we get little response, but at nine hertz, we get resonance of the largest disc. At 10 and a half, very little response, but then at 12 hertz, resonance of the middle disc. At 20 hertz, little response, but at 33, the small disc resonates. So the lesson here is to guard against the potential for resonance where it exists. And that Chinese jade collection was deinstalled at the Art Institute before construction began. Next, the danger of walking of light objects on smooth surfaces. We observed walking of objects on glass shelves at the Clark Art Institute during low level continuous vibrations caused by vibratory sheet pile driving. So at the lower left, we're going to input a steady state, low level vibration at a frequency of 32 Hertz. And if you look very closely at the small glass cordial, you will see that it magically walks to the right toward the steel nut. You see that? Now on the right, we're going to input a frequency of 20 Hertz, again, at a low level. And here you will see that the glass goblet magically walks to the left away from the steel nut. So the lesson here is that objects that have the potential of walking need to be restrained or else watched very closely before being exposed to continuous vibrations. This next example illustrates the fact that short-term vibration exposure is typically not as damaging as longer-term exposure due to fatigue effects. This outdoor art object on the campus of the Art Institute is known as the Sullivan Arch and dates from 1893. Well, protection of the arch was a special case because the contractor wanted to perform vibratory sheet pile driving, which generates longer term continuous vibrations near the base of the arch. So we defined a lower limit, 0.2 inches per second for this object that only applied during the vibratory sheet pile driving. And we allowed a higher limit 
during the remainder of the project when the vibrations were mainly short term and transient, such as from the site demolition and grading work shown there. I just want to mention that Dr. Bill Way from the Netherlands, who is attending this webinar, by the way, uh, greetings to you, Bill. It's probably your dinner time over there, but Bill has published extensively on fatigue effects on art, and his paper from 2014 on this topic is particularly helpful. And finally, I want to briefly note that WJE has begun some research into vibrations that art objects experience during transportation. I know that several other researchers across the world are currently working on this as well. WJE's goal is to measure low level sustained vibrations on art during transport in order to help us understand what limits are safe for art installed in buildings. And we just presented on this topic at a conference in Germany we actually instrumented a dummy art object and crate using three different monitoring systems. And then art handlers actually wheeled the crate around the auditorium while we displayed on the screen the vibrations that were occurring in real time on the frame of the painting inside the crate. So as we get results, and to the extent that they're helpful, we'll be sharing that information with you. Well, that concludes my portion of the presentation. I will now pass it off to Frank and Mark to hear their perspectives. Thank you, Arnie. The monitoring, a monitoring program that Arnie has just described has been used successfully at the Art Institute on a number of occasions. First, during the construction of the modern wing. In planning uh, to undertake the project, we face certain questions. How would construction impact the collection and what would we need to do to ensure safety of the artwork? The Art Institute worked with Arnie Johnson and Robert Hannon of Wiss Janey Elsner Associates starting in 2004 to develop a set of protocols designed to minimize shock and vibration risk. A key part of that protocol lay in defining a conservative vibration limit that would at the same time allow construction, to work, uh, construction work to proceed with minimal disruption. The other two ele elements were the pre-construction study of the building to determine how vibrations would be transmitted through its structure, along with a monitor monitoring program that would provide real-time alerts to stop construct construction activities when the safe limits were exceeded. These are the main questions we were asking ourselves. Uh, you know, which artworks would need to be deinstalled and re relocated? How much temporary storage would we need? Uh, would galleries be closed to the public? Uh, how would we define the uh, the safe vibration limit? And uh, and how would we actually do monitoring during the construction? Uh, having a reliable plan to address these questions is important to ensure protection of the art, but also to avoid disruptions and costly de delays once the construction is started. It gives curators time to rethink installation and give, gives collection managers time to plan for art movement and temporary storage. A clearly defined vibration limit is needed for legal documents and can be used by the contractors to plan to plan their works uh, so as to stay within acceptable limits. And the mu museum administration wants to know if galleries will be closed and how the construction will impact the visiting public's experience. As Arnie has described, the impact of vibrations on an object are dependent on a host of factors, including its size, weight, shape, const constituent materials, construction, and condition. Anticipating the response of an individual object uh, can be very complicated. The vibration control system employed at the Art Institute therefore took a more macro approach, one that, uh, that addressed the protection of the vast majority of objects by relying on a conservative vibration limit set at 0.1 uh, inches, inches per second, as close as possible to the ambient uh, to ambient shock and vibration conditions while allowing construction activities to proceed efficiently and with minimal interruptions. This enabled us to, to then focus more clearly on special situations. One such uh, special situation was the uh, jade installation that Arnie showed earlier, which we decided to move to storage for the duration of the project. We also decided to do deinstall our Chagall stained glass windows even though they were beyond the safe limit. 
In another project involving the demolition and reconstruction of the Jackson Street Bridge near the south end of the museum by the, uh, by the city of Chicago, we elected to reorganize the storage room and introduce vibration dampening pads beneath the storage shelves. The top image shows, uh, shows the excavation for the modern, modern wing in progress. One of the alarm events we experienced occurred when the workers unexpectedly struck a pipe that was connected to the, to the foundation uh, located a considerable distance away, resulting in a transmission of strong vibrations into the museum structure. Work activity was quickly stopped and resumed only after the pipe was cut away from the foundation. The bottom image shows the demolition of a cooling tower in, the close, uh, in close proximity to the AIC galleries. With the knowledge that this phase of demolition would have a heightened impact, the, adju the adjacent galleries were deinstalled for several days while this work was underway, an example of how pre-construction assessment informed the planning process. In the end, everyone involved in a project like this uh, shares two common goals, keeping the collection safe and avoiding disruptions to the construction process. Our mo monitoring program uh, proved, effective, proved effective in both respects. So to summarize, the key elements of the, uh, of the vibration control process uh, are to choose a conservative vibration limit to protect artwork, conduct a pre-construction study to determine how, how vibrations will be transmitted through the building structure to help define a safe line, and finally to implement a vibration monitoring protocol that provides real-time alerts during construction. Mark? Thank you, Frank. Um, I'll start off with just a a brief review of our, of our project. So the museum is gaining about 5,600 square foot uh, feet in, in its expansion, and that includes additional gallery space, lobby, cafe, and bookstore, and as part of an overall uh, transformation of the east end of the, of the Danforth campus at Washington University, which includes uh, three new academic buildings, uh, multiple use facilities, uh, and almost 800 space underground parking garage in our resituated uh, sculpture garden. So the project began uh, in May of 17 and was really uh, surrounded the museum uh, from get-go. Uh, the museum itself has just finalized preparations in advance of the construction on its own building uh, in early June of, uh, of, of this year. And so we were open and operational for over a year with construction uh, all, all around us. And I'll share these experiences and lessons learned uh, in, in my presentation. So first off, and as, as Arnie had mentioned earlier, um, but certainly bears repeating that you know every every building um, really is 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 unique in the way that it uh, it responds to vibration input. Uh, resonant frequencies of buildings, substructures, display and storage furnishings, as well as the object itself, require that a very conservative approach uh, be be taken when, when designing your vibration protection protocols. So the question of to move or not to move. Um, when I joined the staff at the Kemper, um, the project was, was well into development and entering design development and was therefore too late in the process uh, to plan for and or implement any measure for the adequate packing, shipment, storage of the collection offsite. So when undertaking any construction project that can involve exposing your collections to the potential of vibration and deciding whether or not to relocate your collections offsite, there's a few things you want to consider. Certainly, uh, chief among them is its cost, uh, the time required to successfully plan and execute a move of your collections, the suitability of an appropriate facility in a nearby um, area, as well as just the acknowledging and, and understanding all the risks that are associated with any collections move. And I'm not going to get into the details of that because that could require a, a whole other webinar or a series of webinars. Next, a, a brief overview of our collection. So we've got approximately 8,000 objects that vary greatly in size, shape, composition, and condition. By object type, they represent the conventional representation of works on paper, paintings, sculptures, etc. So the decision to move or mitigate um, within our building was really informed by that preliminary analysis of the field, field, uh, field testing uh, that was done uh, on our building and how it responded to vibration input. The critical issue of planning for time to undertake these field trials with actual demolition activities, we need to emphasize that, you know, that to be able to, to have that, uh, that real time uh, case study is really essential in determining our strategy and maximizing the time and associated effort 
related to the relocation and mitigation efforts on our part. So having the, you know, the actual equipment on site is half of it, but then actually going through and, and, and actually conducting some of that demolition was, was critical. We, that, that, safe, that, that safe line that has been referred to a couple of times here today really started our, our planning efforts. You know, we're fortunate that in, in some respects that the building responded uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the input and then we adopted that conservative vibration input that placed all of our collection storage spaces be behind that safe line. And using that safe line as an objective tool, we undertook additional conservative measures and removed and or relocated objects that were in close proximity to that safe line just to, pay, to take another uh, extra conservative step in the process. All phases of the project have the potential to uh, induce vibration and construction projects change direction uh, a, a lot. <laughs> um, so I always wanna think about how these changes may impact your collections uh, that remain on site. Uh, for an example, you know, we've, we're, uh, we're currently in the process of, of, uh, of incorporating an additional construction project or scope within, our, within the original scope. And so that's forcing us to rethink and adjust our plan uh, yet again. So it's a, it is, in all sense of the words, uh, a living animal. Efforts associated with assessing the collections really started uh, by separating out object types. So uh, Frank had mentioned the, 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 the pastels, certainly is one of the, the, the really easy kind of objects to sort of take and place uh, within the, uh, the, the, the confines of the safe line. Then next, we looked at objects that pose a concern by virtue of their construction. So for example, sculptures with sensitive or protruded or extended components. And finally, we, we assessed uh, objects with known condition issues. And for this, um, data from past collections assessment efforts were particularly helpful uh, in, in this effort to really understand um, what condition the collections were uh, in, in the largest possible way. While open during the first year of the project, from May 17 to May 18, uh, when again construction surrounded the institution, we used that safe plan to also determine what and where we could safely install art in the galleries while we were still open to the public. So for example, we did not install any three-dimensional objects and or any uh, collections objects with known condition issues. And so we focused a lot on very stable works on paper. So also to think about, um, plus important to think about the above construction composition and condition issues relative to both short and long-term exposure to vibration. So we're talking, Arnie mentioned the, the fatigue and an ongoing research uh, in, in, that, in that field or in that, with that topic. So relocation mitigation, extremely time consuming. Uh, it takes a huge amount of effort to undertake and also need to, to account for time to not only physically move the objects, but update their locations in the database, um, and then also incorporate time and effort to place things back after construction, again, by going back into the database and, and updating the location. So it's extremely time, um, uh, it takes a huge amount of time to, to, to undertake. Uh, as far as mitigation goes, it's basically in, in its simplest form, isolating the object from the vibration input. And some of the strategies that we undertook at the camper were repeatable at some levels as far as physical, physical locations go, such as the screens, hanging screens, or the, the, the static or the dynamic storage shelves. But we still need to consider the unique characteristics of any object when thinking about how best to protect it. So the images shown here, um, I've got a, a, a shot of, the, of some foam that we've got that serves to isolate the, uh, the work of art that's, that's being stored on the screen as well as a cavity mount that, um, that has a uh, three-dimensional object stored on it, uh, along with some stabilizing uh, bags or weighted bags to prevent it from uh, walking in any capacity. Risk management. Uh, I like to think of the construction project as a temporary dis uh, an exposure to a temporary disaster, uh, and so we need to adapt accordingly. Within the university uh, and our parent organization, we work closely with our, our risk management office as well as our insurance company representative to talk about what was happening well before the project began, not necessarily only when during the renewal process for our, for our policy and to maintain a constant uh, communication with all those involved. So to keep your representative uh, abreast of changes to the project and most, and most importantly, what you're doing to address the issue. And lastly, I think it's just important to, to, to merit, not necessarily um, specifically with the, the, the science behind the vibration, uh, but also just important to understand 
the limits of the contractor's coverage in relation to uh, your own coverage is important to, to uh, take a look at. Honoring communication. Uh, so get to know your contractors um, is really a, a, a critical part here. So attend the meetings, take them on a tour of your collections area to show them specifically what these measures are protecting. Be familiar with the process, learn the language, just get a seat at that table is really a critical part of making sure that these, these projects go in a, in a, they are successful. You wanna place the appropriate staff on a call tree to ensure someone will always be on site to respond to the, automa of the automated system alert or the alert system. So we've got there, we've got a, a recent trigger that uh, received um, that just shows the, uh, the readings and, and you can see the exceeding event on the very bottom there, MP3, where it's 0.102. So that's what instigated the, the communication. So you wanna make sure that you've got enough people on site but not or the, on, on the communication tree, but not too many. Um, so we always have, on our, in our particular instance, we've got somebody from our security department, our preparation department, and our registration department on, on the call, on, the, on, the, uh, on, on the, the tree, excuse me. We also um, utilize the museum's uh, CCTV systems, as well as video cameras that are on, that are trained on the construction site to review any trigger events. So these, this, this video footage capacity was really particularly helpful during the first year we were open and operational and helped identify triggers and ensure the project moved forward with no interruption of the construction and or need to inspect the structure or the collections for damage. Next, the, uh, just talking quickly about the short-term schedules received from the contractors. This really helped put us um, in, uh, on notice and, and so we were uh, able to be particularly vigilant and present during things like uh, field verification, even remote verification, or just uh, in and around these spaces um, when the beginnings of these construction projects, uh, the, the different phases began. So responding to events. Uh, when triggers are received, I or my designate respond as quickly as possible to investigate these triggers. Sometimes the construction team members get the information out before we do, but it's just important to get response out to all included on the email chain so that the, uh, the, event, the event can be investigated further uh, as far as whether or not it actually constituted an exceeding event. Also important to note that work occurs uh, primarily during uh, the, the regular work hours of, of the museum. And so we've had to adjust a little bit with the construction project. So they get going pretty early in the morning. And so we've got to make sure that we've got staff uh, present on site to be able to investigate those, those triggers should they occur. So next up, we'll talk about uh, the, the, the regular weekly reports. So oh, um, I think it's important just to, you know, it's a, it serves as a record to, to make sure that you know, we've got a, a, a comprehensive look uh, and a holistic view of all triggers and associated responses and serves as a record of all past activities. And um, also important to note that these, uh, uh, these sensors are extremely sensitive. Um, so, you know, we've taken some time to initiate some kind of protective measures to prevent those curious and careless from, from triggering uh, the, the associated monitors in place. So in conclusion, the protocols thus far have resulted in a project with informed and involved participants from both the museum and construction, const, construction and contractors perspective. Schedules change a lot. Remember to remain flexible and adaptable. And lastly, uh, respond quickly to triggers to ensure the safety of the collections and for this timely conclusion of all construction related activities. And thank you for now, I'll turn it over to Arnie. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Frank. So that is the methodology that we commend to you if you're undertaking a construction project at your museum. Uh, the details of each of the phases can look different depending on the nature of each project, but Ideally, each phase should be present to best manage the vibrations. The process can be more difficult in, shall we say, non-ideal cases, such as when vibrations are not considered until later in the construction process, or when the construction pro project itself is not under the control of the museum. And of course, vibrations from non-construction sources uh, need to be treated differently, although many of the same principles apply. For further information on this topic, you can refer to the papers that we've authored in recent years. The first one was co-authored with Frank, and the last one 
on my list there was co-authored with Ma uh, Mark DeMauro of the Noy Gallery, New York. Uh, Mark, I believe, is on this webinar, so greetings to you, Mark. Other resources, I've already mentioned the papers by uh, Bill Way. The final bullet refers to a collection of short papers on this topic from the Eastern Analytical Symposium held last November, which was organized by John Scott of the New York Conservation Foundation, assisted by Will Way and Andrew Lynn, uh, retired from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I know several of you from Philadelphia are attending this webinar, so welcome to you as well. So a whole bunch of good resources that you can turn to for further information. And with that, we'll begin to take your questions. Great, thank you, Arnie. As a reminder, everyone, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and hit send. And if we don't get to your question during the call, we will follow up with you afterward. Okay, let's take our first question. It is my understanding that some vibration monitors will not continuously record data unless there is an occurrence that triggers recording. Does this sound right to you? And have you ever heard of this possibly leading to missed data being recorded? Well, this is Arnie, I can take that question. So uh, I think I understand what might be behind the question. Um, the monitors have to record continuously. That's the whole nature of this protocol, right? We have to be sensing vibrations so that we can uh, record anything that's above limit. But I think what you might be referring to is when a threshold is exceeded, a limit perhaps, the monitors will collect an additional amount of data, which is called a waveform. And that gives us as a consultant and an engineering reviewer a lot more information to go on to understand the event. So yes, they are, they should be monitoring continuously and should never miss data. That's very important, 24-7. Uh, but there is an extra amount of data collected when an event is triggered. Okay, uh, this question is for Frank and Mark. What were one or two of the greatest surprises or unexpected events your projects experienced during construction? I'll take that first, uh, take a first whack at that. I think the, the, the thing that surprised us most, especially, you know, we had, uh, I, I think of our project in, a, is in a, a two phases, right? The first one, when the museum itself was not under construction, but was in the midst of construction. And the second phase, which we've just now uh, recently begun uh, with the museum itself undergoing construction, but I think the most the most surprising thing was just the sensitivity of the sensors and the complexities that we had or the challenges that we had with uh, I would say visitor input <laughs> and so you know we've got these out in the public sphere and so you know they're big boxes in an otherwise very um, regimented space and so um, you know, there, there were a lot of, a lot of instances of, of, of the curious sort of um, poking around and kind of wondering what something was. And so we had uh, quite a bit of, of um, work to do on staff education and, you know, working with our security folks to try to um, mitigate or lessen some of those, those, those trigger events that weren't associated with the, uh, with the, with the construction project. Well, if I can jump in there, this is Frank. Um, I, I would say the biggest surprise was a pleasant surprise that we how few uh, um, problems we had. Uh, I think the monitoring uh, process w uh, worked very well, and I think worked particularly well uh, for the contractors. It really gave them, uh, um, you know, parameters that uh, that they could adhere to and operate within uh, without any major problems. And and usually the uh, you know the uh, trigger events that we had. I described. Uh, I described uh, uh, one of them. Another one happened when they were demolishing, uh, and, and a large section of, of concrete wall uh, fell to the ground, and that uh, triggered a, a sudden a, a sudden shock. Um, so uh, I, I would say the, uh, the 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 process worked very well in terms of uh, um, allowing the contractors to plan and operate. Uh, within the limits, except for a few uh, occasions along the way. Does that mean that we were wasting our time doing all this monitoring? I don't think so. I think it means that, uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that the limits we set were worked effectively to, uh, to contain the, the process. Okay, great. Our next question. 
what strategies or agreement discussions are needed when dealing with adjacent properties not controlled by the museum? Right, so this is Arnie, I can take that one. And let me give a shout out to a few museums that have done this, uh, and I think with success. First of all, the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati, and I believe Jerry Green from the Taft is on the webinar here, had to deal with the Ohio Department of Transportation in that, re in that regard. Um, the Art Institute had to deal with um, the Chicago DOT and the Jackson Drive Bridge. Uh, currently working with Rose Wood down in Birmingham at the Birmingham Museum of Art. Again, highway construction next to the building. This presents obviously an added challenge. I would just say quickly, first of all, probably best to just call those individuals. I don't think any of them would mind a phone call. Jerry, I know especially, but I've already referred some uh, people to him. But um, I think first of all, the strategy would be collaboration, right? I mean, if you can work together, if they will work with you, uh, that's, that's best, right? Because then there can be a partnership and things can be worked out reasonably. But I know uh, it would often escalate to stronger measures um, if things like construction cost and schedule are at play because of, oftentimes the bottom dollar is, is what drives things. And so and there are some stronger measures that you could get some advice about from those people uh, that I mentioned. And, and, but I know that presents a lot of additional uh, challenges. Okay, uh, next question. We frequently have DJ events in our museum and I worry about the vibrations that travel up into the galleries above the event space. Is there any crossover with monitoring used for construction with this scenario? Are there any industry rules of thumb for how loud in terms of decibels a DJ can be in a museum space? Oh, it's Arnie again. I could take a quick whack at that. Absolutely, yes is the answer to all of your questions, I believe. And I will uh, take a note of your email here and maybe initiate some further correspondence with you. We've just begun working on some of that. That's becoming much more common in museums as, as I understand it. And by the way, Bill Way, sent us a quick chat here, so I know he's on the line. Bill has done, actually, a lot of his testing, they use loudspeakers to, uh, to, to vibrate the artwork in, in fatigue. So it's a real effect uh, in terms of DB levels and things. Let's correspond offline, but yes, there are some solutions uh, that, that can be brought to bear there. Okay. The next question. Can anyone comment on construction projects that may occur above or below art storage areas or galleries? Mark, you should take this because you've got a storage room right next to that terrace right now. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it's just having a, a really solid understanding of how your, your, your building responds to vibration input is, is, is step one. I think that, that those, those field, tests that uh, Arnie had described in detail uh, related to having the construction equipment on site, doing actual, doing actual demolition to determine where and how vibration gets into your building. And if you, know, you wanna do that as early as you possibly can, clearly, um, because if, if, you're, if your collection storage area falls uh, beyond that safe line, then you've got some, some uh, challenges and, and uh, planning to do to relocate those collections. You know, we're, we're, we're being, or we, we're potentially being faced with, uh, with, with some of that now. I alluded to the, the, the secondary construction project that's coming uh, along in development that um, depending on the, the scope and scale of it may impact um, some of our collection storage areas that wasn't uh, originally thought, uh, thought of or, or, or designed uh, in, within the, uh, the the current scope, so I think the first step is just getting getting out ahead of it and and getting a, a clear idea of where that safe line is in your building, and then and then planning planning accordingly. Okay, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, have you looked into uh, the use of added mounts for objects to mitigate the vibrational factors affecting the artworks? Um, and then another person kind of followed on to that question and said, "I would be very interested in any suggestions." for methods for vibration mitigation for paintings on walls directly onto a building site. Well, I could comment on that briefly. This is Arnie again. Um, yes, uh, mitigation becomes uh, essential in some cases, right? I mean, for example, you might've read the paper about the uh, mitigation that was done for the Metropolitan Museum of Art for the Egyptian gallery. I mean, those objects could not be moved. I'm currently working at a museum where there's a large object that is in a spot that it cannot be moved and vibrations are concerning. So in those cases, mitigation is your only option. 
As Mark described, sometimes mitigation is an additional protection. But yes, there are things that can be done. Uh, there are sorbethane pads, for example, we're working with uh, Dr. Chavez from Oxford right now on some design of isolation for a very uh, important isolation and mitigation uh, method that we're doing. Other simplified things can be done, um, such as suspension systems. Now, I know that Jerry Padania is on the webinar as well, uh, retired from the Getty. Of course, in seismic zones, right, mitigation is done as part of original design for a display, right? So there are a lot of options. I would just uh, uh, suggest that you get in touch with some experts uh, that have done that before. And, um, and yes, it's, it's very, very possible, but sometimes pretty tricky. Okay. So that is all the time that we have for questions today. Um, I'd like to thank Arnie and Frank and Mark, and of course, all of you for joining us. We hope that you found it educational. As a reminder, we will send you an email with instructions to receive credit for participating in today's webinar. And we will also provide a recording of this webinar for you to share with your colleagues. Again, we really appreciate your time and we hope you have a great rest of the day.